Welcome back. Welcome back to Coffee with Crav. I am really excited, very, very excited about uh, today's uh, guest. I think that you'll uh, really enjoy hearing Norma. Now, um, I just want to talk a little bit about Wall Street and what was going on in Wall Street, what has been going on in Wall Street for a very long period of time. Wall Street has been a guy's place, right? It's been a man's place. If you watch any movies, but Fox on Wall Street, and you look at the brokers there, it was all men, right? Maybe you saw one woman. I know I started in the 1980s. And at Lehman Brothers, we had three women, and our boardroom was close to 200 people. And then when I went to Payne Weber, which became UBS, again, we saw very, very few women. And Wall Street has always been known as a man's place. However, you're going to find out today's guest was someone that was breaking down the walls. So let me read the bio of Norma Hasen Namius Yeager. She is an entrepreneur, a stockbroker, a business pioneer, and a published author. In 1962, she became the first woman to enroll in Hornblower and Weeks training program for stockbrokers. She's the first woman who demanded and got the right to join her male trainees on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. The Stock Exchange did not previously allow women to step foot on the floor. Shame on them. Norma was the only woman invited to be on Hornblow and Week's Management Advisory Board. She registered with the Liquidity Fund with the SEC. It was the first money market mutual fund in California. Norma Yeager registered and opened a full-service stock brokerage firm, Yeager Securities, in 1981. She started a second firm, Yeager Capital Markets, which she opened in 1991. Breaking Down the Walls is a memoir of her years on Wall Street as a business pioneer. I bring everybody, Norma Yeager. So, Norma, what's a, nice, what's, what's a nice Brooklyn-born lady doing in California? Well, I married my second husband after a divorce, and he wanted to live in California. He asked me if I would mind doing that because he, he hated New York. It was cold, and he was a, uh, a surgeon, and uh, he hated getting up in the morning and going to work with the weather in New York. So we took a trip to California and decided that that was going to be a nice place for us to live. We bought a house and moved. It was that simple. <laughs> I asked my firm if they would transfer me. They had a wonderful office in Beverly Hills, and they transferred me to their office in Beverly Hills, and off we went. Well, let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me take you back a little bit. Let's go back to, to Brooklyn. Uh, similar to you, I was born in Brooklyn. I lived in Sheepshead Bay. I believe you lived in, in Sheepshead Bay. Yes. Uh, growing, growing up, when do you remember having an interest in uh, in the stock market? Actually, I was always very good in math. I loved puzzles. I loved math. I loved all these things associated with that. Um, and of course, eventually, I went into City College of New York to take um, accounting. I thought I'd become an accountant uh, because I liked it that much. Uh, I started at that time not to think about the stock market because that wasn't something that we did uh, in my home. Um, but as I got into college and started talking to people, people started to make me aware of the stock exchange. And someone called me one morning and asked, uh, would you like to buy this stock? So I bought, a, I think, a small stock and of course, it went nowhere <laughs> but down. <laughs> so that discouraged me. And um, and then I, when I got married and I had my first baby, I started walking with a carriage um, in the neighborhood. And I noticed there was, at that time, uh, storefronts had uh, stock offices. And I used to peer through the window and look at the clicking of the, uh, at that time, the board, uh, where they listed all the stocks and uh, it was like a ticker tape thing that went by with all the all the symbols and and the prices that's going up and down, right? 
if you like. But the, the companies offered uh, sheets of recommendations of different stocks and so on. So we'd pick one up or look at one. And of course, with my background in accounting, I was always interested in seeing how they got to the uh, earnings and, and uh, you know, uh, the growth uh, conversations about uh, the stock. And so it was a natural thing. If I went to work, I was looking to get into a so-called stock exchange uh, business. I never thought in terms of a stockbroker, except that a friend of mine's husband was a uh, manager of uh, one of the offices of Hornblower. And he said, you know, if I at that time was thinking of a divorce and I was thinking of getting into a business. Well, let me, let me, hold, let me hold you up there, Norma. You, you're going a little bit too fast. Let, let's, let's, let's go back. Let's back up the truck a little bit. Okay. Uh, let's, let, let's, go, let's go back to your days in the Catskills because I was reading your book, uh, which is an excellent book, and you were bringing up three kids all by yourself. You had many, many challenges while you were in the Catskills. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about those, those challenges? I think this is important for the story so that people can understand the challenges that you went through prior to even uh, going into the Hornblower and Weeks training program. Okay. Um, one day my husband came to me and he said, I have a wonderful opportunity. Um, one of our friends who is a nutrition uh, got a um, offer to uh, wire new group of houses at Lake Louise Marie, which at that time was a resort area. And um, he says, I, I'd like to go and, and do that. And I want to change from, he was a cutter in the garment industry. I'd like to do that. We can make some more money. We says, I get out of this field of uh, the, the garment industry and so on. And so he says, I accepted going with him as a partner. He will stay and get the jobs and I will do them. <laughs> and so off we went with uh, two children. There were two boys. And, um, and we um, had a, a very nice life to begin with. It was lovely. It was in the Catskills. It was near Grossinger's and near, uh, you know, all the various uh, fun places to be. But that was great in the summertime. But then the winter came. <laughs> And the builder that my husband was working with started to hold back on, on the payments. And um, we learned that he was going into bankruptcy. The houses were not selling. He was not going to keep going and, um, and did not pay us any, any money from that point on. So um, we, in order to um, save the money, we moved into one of his houses. And he wasn't paying us anyway, but he wanted his rent. I said to my husband, you better tell him when he pays us, we'll pay him. Of course, that didn't happen. He went back to us. He gave us the winter to live there. However, that was terrible. It was at the lake. All the houses that were occupied, the people had gone back to the city. It was a summer place. And so I was there with two children, and then I gave birth to my daughter uh, there as well. So here I had an infant and two boys who were enrolled at school. And, uh, and I was left there with nobody in, around the lake except me and my family. And it was scary, I have to tell you. Across from the lake, I noticed a big bear. I, mean, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And so I locked up everything. I didn't want him to know that, the, that my house was uh, occupied because most of them were vacant. And, and I quieted down our dog and, our, and my children. And then it snowed so badly one day that I thought I couldn't see through the windows. I mean, it was so much snow. And my daughter was ill. They had to call the police department to get her, her medication. So they finally got to me. And that was, I don't, I, I don't even remember, I think on one of these plow trucks, it was horrible. I opened the door one morning to bring in somebody, I had milk delivered to bring in a bottle of milk and the door slammed behind me and I was locked out and my baby's crying in the house. So I took off a slipper and broke the, door, the window in order to open the door. It was a horrible experience, I have to tell you. It was frightening. 
Um, food was low. I, we had very little money. I was stretching um, my meats by, by adding bread to them so that the hamburgers would you know, stretch out. It, it was a hard existence. Finally, I said to, um, my, my husband left and went to New York to see if he could get a job to send me some money. So your husband wasn't with you during that whole period oh, of time? No, 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 I was there alone with the two, with the three children, with a screaming baby, two boys. The only thing that kept me covered was Jack Mullane. I would get up in the morning and exercise with him. And uh, he was my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and the boys were picked up by school bus, which they had to climb up towards the road where the school buses would uh, um, uh, pick them up. Anyway, it was a very, very difficult time for me at that time. And um, finally, I said, you know, I can't live here like this. Once I saw that bear, I, mean, <laughs> I, was, I was out. And, I, think, uh, I, think the, I think the important point here is that you have this perseverance. Uh, that you don't let things, you know, get to you, and that you can overcome uh, these these hardships. I think that's a very important thing. That is a common theme that I see uh, in in your lifetime, right? Oh yes, I I believe that failure only makes you stronger. If you you get failed in one thing, you move on. You move on. You cannot let fear interfere with your life. Fear is the worst thing that could happen to you. Because if you're afraid, you never can take that first step. And the first step is the important one, to get yourself out of a rut. And it took me a long time to even get a divorce or a situation that I was in, unhappy in. And uh, um, hey, you, you, write in, you write in your book that you, you, you talk about uh, going to a therapist, Doc Grossman. Who who helped you? And you, I, I appreciate the, your honesty about you know the difficulties that you had and the fact that you you know you went to a therapist, which at the time was something that you know people frowned upon, but yet you saw the opportunity and and you utilized that opportunity and that helped you through your through your lifetime. So I appreciate that uh, that honesty there. Well, it was a very tough time for me, and I realized that I was not moving forward, and I also realized that I was suicidal. I mean, I was so bad. I was afraid that I would do that, and uh, and I asked if I could see, uh, talk to somebody, and I was recommended to Dr. Go Grossman, who saved my life. I mean, he said, listen, you're in a rut, and you got to step out of it, and you have to, you have to get a divorce. I said, what? Divorce? How do I do that with three children? I have no income and so on. He says, well, we're going to do it together. We're going to take that first step. He says, you don't need psychotherapy. You just need a push. <laughs> so he pushed. And um, fortunately for me, he pushed me into a divorce. That was the, the, the most important thing I needed to do at that time was to get rid of this anchor that was holding me down. And... Uh, and he did. He helped me a lot with it. And I recommend anybody that needs the help to go and get it. Look for it. It's important because if you can't take the first step yourself, somebody's got to take your hand and help you with it. That's great. That's really fantastic advice. Let me let me go back over to Hornblower and Weeks, which we talked about. So for those of you that's listening and watching today, um, Hornblower and Weeks was a well-known brokerage firm at the time, kind of like a Morgan Stanley uh, today. Uh, you applied for a job as a stockbroker, but there was no woman brokers. So let's let's talk about that uh, that experience. How hard was it getting that job? And second question there is, how were you treated by the other male brokers? Well, when I realized, I moved back to New York and I moved in with my mother-in-law because we had no money for an apartment. And my husband was just starting on a job. And, uh, and so we needed the help with the family. And um, I realized that I had to go to work because it was not good enough for me to stay home and not have the income coming in. So I was visiting a friend of mine whose husband was a manager at Home Blower. And he said to me, if, I asked, I said, did I think I'm going to have to go to work? He said, if you're serious, we're starting a training program 
And why don't you apply? We used to talk stock market all the time. He said, I think you're a natural. So I said, really? I didn't know they hired women. He said, well, I don't know that they will, but it's about time they should. And uh, he says, I will set up an appointment for you, which he did. And um, when I met the managers, they said they, they had at that time, and I don't know if they still do, uh, you had to go through three days of psychological testing uh, because they wanted to make sure they invest a lot of money in you. And they want to make sure that you have the aptitude for this kind of a business. And so I took those tests and they called me and they said, you did very well and we'd like to hire you, but we don't know what to pay you because we've never hired a woman before. I said, but you have a classroom full of men and what are you paying them? Oh, well, you know, they have families, they have to support them. I said, I'm not coming to work for fun. I have an additional expense. I have to hire a wife. He said, what? I said, well, who do you think will take care of my children if I come to work? unless you want me to come part time. Oh no, he said, you have to be in the class and do what everybody else is doing if you want to be in the program. And so I accepted the, pro the job. And then I told my husband, he didn't even know I was applying. Wow. And so it was horrible at that time, but and my, my mother-in-law helped out a little bit. And then we, we got an apartment and I had to get some help for taking care of it. I had to hire a wife. <laughs> That's exactly what I had to So they, they wanted to pay you less that, because well, you were they, a woman. Well, they didn't know what to pay me. They said they never hired a woman in this business before. Oh. And so they didn't know what to pay you. Pay you the same thing. No? That's <laughs> what I said. I said, why not pay me the same thing? And by the time I got through, he agreed. <laughs> so, Good. Um, so I and was, how were you? How were you treated by the other, uh, the other male well, brokers? I get comments. Why are you here? You're holding down a job that another man can do to support his family. I said, I'm not coming to work for fun. I'm coming because I need to work. And uh, I said, I'm going to do the best I can at this job. If I make it, I make it. And if I don't, I'm going to have to find some other thing to do, which I'm not qualified for at the time. So anyhow, um, they were angry. They were, I was competitive and they didn't like it. And, um, um, and I did very well in the training program. I, uh, we were taught to cold call, which is one of the most difficult things to do, to get on a phone and talk to somebody for the first time and try to bring him out because you want to make a client of this gentleman. So they teach you that. And then they let you loose and they tell you, uh, okay, I want you to go out and practice. And so we had to go to different offices, different places of business. And I, uh, the um, office that I was attached to was on Park Avenue. And so I was going out and uh, walking around the streets and looking at stores and going in and out of ele elevators to see you know, acquaint myself with the neighborhood. And then I saw um, uh, the jeweler. <laughs> um, what's his name? I forgot his name already. Winston, Winston. Um, Winston Jewelers. The Winston Jewelers, uh, which was a storefront on Madison Avenue. And I walked in, told, and I asked for Mr. Winston. So the gentleman says, well, what do you want to talk to him about? I said, I just want to talk to him about his investment. Well, he doesn't do his investment himself. And there's somebody upstairs who takes care of his investment. So they send me upstairs and there's a woman who is doing all of his investments, a wonderful woman, who said to me, yeah, finally making it, making it uh, with women. He says, it's about time. She said, we do have to braid once in a while. Anyway. The, the interview went very well. I came back to the class and discussed what I did. And the men were very, Winston's jeweler, how did you do that? I said, I walked in. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> I walked in and asked. And if you don't ask for the order, you will never get it. You right. have to. Ask. And that's it. You got to get the courage to do what you need to do. Yeah, it was it was interesting in, in reading the book. You uh, you bring up the name uh, Earl Rubin, 
And I'll tell you that I know the name because my dad had a very, very tiny account at Hornblow and Weeks, and his advisor was Earl Rubin. So Earl Rubin in the Kravitz household was very revered. And as I understand reading your book, uh, he, uh, he was very key in, in your success as well. Oh, yes. He became my manager. I said, they asked what office I'd like to work in. I said, Earl Rubin's office, because he recommended me. He had the idea that I would make a good broker, and I can't let him down. I put my monkey on my own back. <laughs> so uh, I said, I want to work in his office, and um, if I make it, I want him to be proud of me. So it was something that gave me a goal, and, um, and I did. I worked in his office, and he was helpful. Uh, I was the only woman there, and um, a salesman, uh, uh, a salesman that I knew, said to me, "No, you got to set yourself apart. You're sitting in an office full of men. People look through the windows. You know, at that time, people would walk along Park Avenue and look through the windows of the stock exchange, and you have to not look like a secretary." He said, I want you to go out and buy yourself three very expensive suits. I said, where am I going to get the money from that? He said, go get a loan. He said, you'll pay it back. You're making money. And at that time, I was I don't know, I think $10,000 a year for that. No man made that kind of money <laughs> in 1961. Anyhow, so I got three suits with fur trim and, um, and, and pillbox hats. And he said, and you're to sit all day with your hat and your, 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 your um, fancy suit and get a brooch. And you're going to be known as the brooch, hat and brooch lady. So the people looking through the window would say, who's that? And it, it worked. It was very good. It, that was I, yeah. excellent advice. You, you, you differentiated yourself uh, uh, quite a bit. And, and, and so you developed yourself and you developed a very, very nice business. Now, some people would say that being the only woman advisor would be a detriment, but it sounds like you've made it as an advantage. Is that is that right? Did you take that and, and make it as an advantage that you were you well, the only I woman? certainly did. I, uh, one gentleman was, uh, came into the, uh, the office and uh, he sat down and I saw him every day. He would come in and sit down. And um, then he approached me and he said, uh, he said, uh, I like the way you work. I've been watching you and I like the way you work. He said, would you handle my account? So I said, I would be delighted, but what do you mean you were watching me? He said, you know, all of my professionals are women. In order to make it in this world as a woman, he said, you have to be better than the rest. And I was so impressed with that. I mean, he really boosted me up. And I did manage his account for a long time. He was one of those, my clients for a long time. And so was Winston. The, young, the lady called me and gave me my first big order when I got uh, registered. So it really was a, uh, you know, I cold called it. I managed to get to talk to people because I was an oddity telling them that I was a stockbroker. Oh, you're, you're kidding. You're, you're selling cosmetics? I said, I'm not selling cosmetics. I'm <laughs> selling stock. And the point was, um, I was out there dressed up and I dressed for the job. I was selling million dollar worth of stock and I had to look like a million dollars, like I was worth a million dollars. I wasn't worth more than a nickel, but <laughs> I did. I did go out and, and get a loan. I went to the bank next door and I said, you know, I need to take out a personal loan. They said, well, where's your husband? I said, my husband's not taking the loan. I am. Well, we don't give women loans without their husbands. They have a sign on. I said, look, I have a good job right next door. Call my boss and you'll see I can pay off the loan. And he did. And he called my boss and he did give me the loan. That's how I bought those three suits. Where would I get the money for that? <laughs> uh, so That's a good story. So, so you, you had moved to California. You uh, were working at Drexel Burnham. Um, well, that's and, much later, much, much, much later. Right, well, but, but 
uh, during that time, you were disrespected on a deal that was brought to them by a woman. Yeah. And you said, you know what, this is enough. I can't take this anymore. Um, I want to start my own firm. And you started Jaeger Securities, a woman owned brokerage firm, which at the time, uh, I don't know if there was a, you know, a woman owned brokerage firm. So um, was that a scary situation? Was that a scary proposition? Well, again, I had my second husband who backed me. It was important to know that he felt comfortable for me to leave my job and start a, uh, a small brokerage. I thought I could take my clients with me. They, they respected me. I was able to do my business through Hornblower. And... Um, uh, actually, I don't think I was with Hornblower at the time. I, I don't think so. I was, uh, I think, with Drexel at the time. Anyhow, I managed to, fortunately, I had the background of the training program. I don't think I ever could have done it without going through that training program because they put me through all the steps of the business, you know, how to put in the order, where the order went, how they executed the order. And I looked upon the um, analysts of the firm to give us ideas to get me to understand why that company was recommended. And, uh, and I was able to bring that to my clients. So I was doing very well. And it was a commissioned business. And at that time, uh, the commissions were exorbitant. <laughs> um, then they did negotiated commissions. By the time they negotiated the commission, my salary was cut in half because uh, they lowered the commissions a great deal. Um, no, Norma, we, we have a, a Dana from, from the audience that raised her hand. Uh, Dana, if I can ask you to write in your question on the Q&A, uh, and uh, this way I can ask Normal question. While we do this, I uh, I do I want to bring on a uh, Norma, a special guest to Coffee with Crab. It's the first time that we're doing it. Uh, it's our own Kathy Crundon. So Kathy, can you can you come on now? And Hello. there she is. All mm -hmm. right. So for those of you who do not know Kathy, she is the engine behind Align Wealth. She's our executive director. Um, to give you some background, a chair person and member of the Field Professional Council for over five years running. Uh, she's been uh, co-chair of the Hightower Philanthropy Committee. In 2016, she was the recipient of the National Association of Professional Women's Circle of Excellence. I think that she's a circle of excellence every year, but that's me. Uh, Kathy uh, has been in the industry for over 25 years and she was asking me questions that she wanted to ask Norma. So I said, Kathy, why don't you just come on? So Kathy, I know you had some questions for, for Norma. Uh, please, uh, please ask. Sure, Norma, it's a pleasure to be on with you today. Um, just wanted to ask you a few things, wanted to, uh, learn a little bit more about having that work-life balance with raising kids, working long hours, and how you were able to manage both at the same time. Well, I found that I had to have the help. I can't. I could not do it without help because somebody had to be home when the children got home from school. Somebody had to take them in, and so. The first thing I did when I started to bank my salary was to hire help. So you cannot do it alone. It's too difficult. The children suffer, you suffer, and it's dangerous for the children to be left alone. And to know that the first thing you do is make sure your family is secure. Then you can go out with a peace of mind that you can do a job. And once you do the job, the family is out of your head. They're taken care of, right? The next thing you have to do is do your job. And that is important because in order to succeed, you have to do the job that you were hired for. And you have to work at it. It's not a game, it's a job. And, uh, and you have to live up to what you sold to get the job. Uh, and so uh, once I was at work, the children were cared for and I didn't think about home anymore. 
once I got home, I put on my house dress. I took off my fancy suits yeah. and hats, and I became a housewife. I was dressed for that job <laughs> and uh, started dinner. And I only had the help while the children were home. And so I had to now take my, my other job and start making dinner for the family and helping with homework and doing my job 100% at home. And listen, a little bit, the job suffers, a little bit, the family suffers. You can't do 100% on both, but you have to be willing to do the 90% and, and work at it. Great, thank you. So I, I know that when you started in this business and it was um, a, a pioneer and just you kind of breaking the way through for other women in this industry, what do you think that the financial industry can continue to do better to make it more of an equal opportunity for women today? One of the things that I see today, which bothers me, is the fact that um, uh, they don't, and they don't want the women to succeed. I think that they put obstacles in their way. And it, I think it's a man's psyche, maybe, that um, you're competitive and they don't like it. Uh, we used to go to have uh, conferences at uh, men's clubs. They made sure that the women had in a women's dining room. They didn't allow us into the dining room. They yeah. didn't allow us on the golf courses. They didn't allow us to do the things the men were doing. And the men objected to it. They didn't want us there. They really did not. It was that we, they, we were competitive and they felt we were taking things away from them. And, uh, and they were very vocal about it. They yeah. made sure you do it. <laughs> But oh. again, you have to put on a hard shell and not listen. And if you have right. to put it in your ears, you do that. <laughs> you just... Speaking speaking of hard shell, you know, you, you started your own brokerage firm and it wasn't just good enough to start a brokerage firm. You also uh, started Jaeger Capital Markets uh, and you started doing deals. Uh, can you talk about that experience? And I, I know I read about that AB 1933 bill, which ordered California state government to award business to women owner uh, businesses and that, that helped things. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, uh, while I was handling Yeager Security, they came out with a bill called AB something, which uh, awarded um, minorities, and women, a percentage of uh, jobs for uh, bidding on jobs for government. Uh, prior to that, they did not. And uh, you could try to get a uh, contract with the government, but it was not possible because you were at a disadvantage. And so they tried to equal the playing field by allowing minorities to get a uh, I believe a 15% um, award of a contract and women got 5%. And in order to get that 5% or in order to put in your bid, you had to register as a woman owned firm or as a minority firm for the state. And they had a setup where we had to go in and um, uh, sign up and prove that you were 100% owned woman firm. Now, my husband in California is a community property state. And so my husband had to sign off on his share of my property with the, with the office that I was opening. And I was afraid to go home and ask him to do that. I mean, how do you tell your husband to give up his 50% <laughs> at that award? But he was very happy to do it. He said, if that's what you want, you got it. I'll sign. And he did. So I was now 100% owner of a female brokerage firm. And therefore, I was able to go to every state. And I did. I went to every state to talk to the Treasury Department to uh, bid for their, their brokerage business. And that built the capital bargains to doing a huge business because I became a uh, execution 
as a firm for uh, uh, institutional business. And that was a big gift. I closed out and got rid of Yeager Securities, which was a retail business, which was full of headaches. And let's get Yeager Capital Markets, which eventually I sold and retired. But I have to tell you that that bill changed my whole life. <laughs> I was running all over the country, um, making appointments. The first, uh, the first appointment I made once I signed up as a woman-owned firm was to go to California CalPERS, their public employees retirement system. I made the appointment. And that's the largest. That's the largest in in all of the country, correct? The largest, the largest pension plant in the entire country. And talking about Hutzman, if you know what Hutzman is, <laughs> I yes. called up and made an appointment. And in order not to be late the next day, because you know they have fog, and I had to fly from Los Angeles to San Francisco when he was situated, I was afraid I'd be stuck. So I left the day before to make sure I'd be there on time. And when I got there, he said, my God, thank God, I found a woman. Here I am mandated to give a certain percentage to a woman on firm. But where was I gonna find one with the experience? By that time, I had 10 years of a firm year of security open. So I was qualified to go there and, and talk to him. And he was charming. He introduced me to all his uh, desk traders and told them that they had to give me some of the transactional business. And that started me running. Now, I, when I went to any other uh, uh, state, I said, my big client, this California public employees, is the well, wow, that got me a, an open door. Sure. So you, I, Absolutely. You need, a, you need a catch. I needed something to, why would they hire me? Yeah, you needed a catch. And I had the experience. I wasn't afraid to do the business. And um, and I had the uh, the network. I had a trade, traders on my desk. They knew what they were doing. I hired them because they knew their business. And it worked out to be a big firm. That's great. I just so everybody knows, if they if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, at the very bottom of the screen, there's a Q and A. You can just hit that button. And you can just type in a question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Kathy, do you have any uh, any other questions for for Norma? Sure. One thing that I would like to get your opinion on is um, just how should women who are young women who are coming into these industries that are male dominated, what advice can you give them to succeed? like you did in, in these types of environments? When you go into a new business, any business, whether it be the stock brokerage business or any business, you, you cannot feel that you are inferior. You've got to feel that you can do the job. I mean, if you walk in there and say, oh my God, can I do this job? Don't go. <laughs> you really have to do a, a mind job to say to yourself that I'm very capable of doing it or I shouldn't be here. And the important thing is that you have to have the confidence in yourself. You have right. to have the education to do the job. You have to know what the job entails and you have to make yourself qualified. I mean, you're not gonna go there to fail. You're going there to win. And in order to win, you have to have the tools to win. And that's your education of the job um, what you are expected to do, you have to know what is expected of you, whether you're female or male. The male has just as much uh, problems to succeed as we did, and they have to do their job. And so you don't, don't make yourself feel inferior. You're going to do a job you're capable of, and that's a head job. <laughs> right. Talk to you. Oh. Look at the mirror oh. and say, I could do this job. I mean, you've you've uh, you've said it all. Uh, you've, you know, this has been uh, eye-opening and fantastic, and and great words of advice. Any any final thoughts, and uh, what are some of the things that you're doing uh, these days? Well, these days I'm growing older, and uh, I start doing some of the other things that I need to do. Um, I um, I read a lot. I belong to two or three book clubs. 
and I do a lot of uh, reading. I um, now the last year, of course, I've been on a lot of Zoom programs. We have <laughs> a literature program. We have an art program, um, and I get involved. If I'm not involved, I'm not happy. I have to be involved. That's I great. Walk, I go out and walk because it's good for me to walk. I try to walk. I um, uh, meet friends. And of course, this last year has been a disaster. I lost a year. <laughs> so, but I occupied myself and uh, uh, I, I do enjoy learning. I'm always trying to learn. And so I joined this literature class where we meet on Zoom. Everything's done on Zoom. And so I, um, I think Zoom is here to stay, to be honest with you. I don't <laughs> think it's a, uh, a problem that, that we solved for temporary uh, use. Zoom is here to stay. That, that's a little bit of great stock to buy at the beginning. Um, well, Norma. <laughs> You've you've said it all. I want to thank you so much, and and a a happy birthday for tomorrow. Cinco de Mayo is tomorrow, and tomorrow's yeah. your birthday. So I want to I want to wish you a uh, very happy, healthy birthday. And uh, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us, and and thank everybody for uh, for listening. And uh, once again, our coffee with Crav is at ten o'clock the first Tuesday of the month. Next month will be uh, June 1st at uh, 10 o'clock. We're going to do a market update. So uh, I'd love everybody to, uh, to join us there. And thanks so much for your time. Take care, everybody. And uh, Norma, thanks so much for your time. And Kathy as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Norma. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Kathy.